Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the first of a series of creative exchange dialogues for 2023, where this year we'll be focusing on circular design. My name is Africa Milana and it's a joy and a pleasure really to be back here for another conversation. Now this year we'll have two dialogues, one today, another one in a date that will announce in July, and then that will be followed by a two-day festival uh, in August. So it's quite truncated than in the previous couple of years. But that is for good reason, and we'll explore that in a second. It also means we are focused on the topic and the subtopics that we extract from that, and hopefully you get to engage with us throughout using the hashtag creative exchange. Um, we'll be with you this afternoon, of course, for 90 minutes, as always. Not only are you joining us from the comfort of your home, your office, wherever you choose to be in the world today, but we've got a room full of people here. It's probably the, uh, the most amount, actually, of people we have had in one of these in quite a long time, which is good to have. Um, to have. And they're here with many, many questions around this very important topic. When I think of circular design, I think of reuse, I think of refurbishment, I think of repairing, I think of sharing, I think of basically not consuming excessively and unnecessarily as far as limited natural resources are concerned. How do we contextualize this best for South Africa? How do we contextualize this best for the African continent? And we've invited some incredible specialists and uh, people knowledgeable of the space uh, for you, and we'll introduce you to them in a short while. But of course, this creative exchange series of dialogues is happening uh, in part because of the incredible and generous support of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. And joining me on the couch is the uh, Consul General to Cape Town, that's Helene Rekers. Helene, lovely to have you again. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It is good, is it not, to have a full house as well as a, an audience that is streaming us right now, is it not? Um, thank, you, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. All right, let's get the sound guys to sort that out and yeah. while we'll... There yes, you go. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, yes, yes. So, uh, excuse me, excuse me, Africa. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, and uh, it is a full house. I'm very, uh, I'm very happy to see that. Uh, and it is a topic that is uh, very close to my heart, uh, circularity. And it is because you actually have done quite a lot of work in this space. I, I have. In, uh, in my, during my previous posting, um, I was very active uh, with, uh, that was in Turkey, and uh, creative uh, for a circular design in the sense of circular textile design uh, was a big uh, big topic there that uh, we worked very closely together between the Netherlands and Turkey. Um, so, yes. So what are you hoping to achieve out of this process? Well, I think we are perhaps here in a, in a phase uh, uh, before uh, the phase that we were in in Turkey. I think we are here still assessing in what areas uh, circularity is uh, the most, uh, uh, offers the most opportunity. Uh, and, uh, and I really want to uh, uh, repeat uh, what you said yourself about there's a lot of re's in, uh, in circularity. It is, it is much more than recycling. It is much more than uh, refer uh, refurbishing or uh, reusing. Uh, it is really uh, the holistic approach uh, to uh, using products until the end of their life cy uh, cycle and then uh, trying to get as much uh, back from uh, into the economic uh, uh, m uh, field again from those products uh, for n uh, for new uh, use, uh, and uh, I think for Africa uh, it, there there could be a lot of possibilities. It could be waste uh, in, in in waste management. It could be in uh, in, in the agriculture uh, space, it could be there. There, it could be. There are so many uh, examples, also from the Netherlands, where where you see uh, this being applied. Um, and I'm really curious to hear uh, what the experts have to say uh, in what areas they think uh, uh, it would be uh, applicable here. Absolutely. And of course, joining us uh, not in uh, person today because she's out in KwaZulu Natal doing some incredible work is Erica. Erica Alk is a group CEO for the Craft and Design Institute. And Erica, it almost seems a little bit silly, but this is what you guys do on a daily basis, isn't it? Good afternoon. 
Um, hi, Africa. Yeah, this is, uh, I mean, I, I think the, the, the fact that we're in a full house there, I haven't seen the picture yet, but I'm looking forward to it. Um, and that there's been such a kind of upswelling of people wanting to come to listen to this topic, I think means that we're all really hungry um, for more knowledge and more information. I think, I think there's sort of clarity around we need to think much more carefully about um, how we're making products. So I want to add, a, I want to add another re, and that's rethink. So um, actually, that we're thinking right at right at the beginning before we even create products. Um, what is the lifespan of that product, and what else are we putting in onto, onto the planet? Um, so yeah, I mean, I think this is. I'm um, looking forward to to hearing what the experts have to say and seeing how we can take it forward as a as a as a community. We'll be exploring with the guests uh, issues of behavioral change a little bit later. How, 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 do we, how do we shift the space that you're in from a novelty and nice to have and in order for you to acquire the product, you actually have to shell quite a bit of money to this is the norm. This is how it should be and this is how we should all be de um, consuming and behaving. So I think I think the big the, the uh, yeah I'm also going to interested to hear what the behavior behaviorists have to say because I think ultimately it is going to come down to to our individual actions um, and I, I was thinking while um, Helene spoke because I think we are actually at a kind of early stage so it doesn't seem like systemically this issue of circularity is is in is in the system. Um, and I'm talking sort of public-private sector. So I, I think that a large part of what we need to think about is how we raise consciousness um, about the need, the need to think in this way, and the need to be conscious about the way we, what we, what we use and how we use it. Um, don't have the answers to any of this yet. So I think um, this journey that we're going on for the next few months is is going to be quite instructive. Yeah, I'm certainly looking forward to it. Erica, thank you very much. Enjoy your time in KZN. Um, you mentioned that you've been through this one, one time beforehand. Let me ask you the question that I asked Erica. What is that shift that is required in order to move an entire society, really, towards realizing that this is the only way forward? Yes. Well, um, uh, the experience in the Netherlands is that actually all stakeholders, uh, one, need to work together. Um, but why do, you need to, uh, why do you work together? Because you have benefits from working together. So for the consumers, there should be economic and societal benefits uh, that uh, when they get something recycled or reused, that it is really quality uh, uh, that they uh, receive. And for the, for, the uh, for the business community, it should be economically uh, beneficial uh, to, uh, to engage in this. And of course, for the government or for the uh, authorities, it should be uh, uh, a society, societal and economic benefits uh, should be clear uh, about, for instance, that let's say in the case of waste, that waste is not being left everywhere and that, uh, uh, and that there's uh, a good uh, system in place um, uh, to deal with uh, uh, the circularity of waste. So th the economic and societal benefits, I think, are a very important factor. All right, let's get the conversations going. Helen, thank you very much. We'll chat again in about 17 minutes or so. Uh, Helen Rekers, of course, is the Consul General for the Kingdom of the Netherlands here in Cape Town in South Africa. And Erika Alk is a Group CEO for the Craft and Design Institute. Uh, we will be bringing in our guests now to talk to the various elements and the important questions that are uh, coming in. Let me tell you who they are before I introduce you to them. Uh, Ndomeko Moyana is the Chief Executive of Ben Peter Holdings, um, ASIN South African Chapter Lead, as well as a Council Member of the Cape Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Then we have uh, Karim, um, Karin Boomsma. Uh, Karin is the Director of Sustainable Inclusive Business based in Kenya and has background in business-to-business -business communication, creating concepts, projects, and campaigns that bring ideas and people together. And closest to me is Saloshini Naidu, who is the Circular Economy Program Manager at Green Crepe, an organization that drives the widespread adoption of economically viable green economy uh, solutions. Green Cape, in fact, is one of our partners in this series of conversations, as is the city of Cape Town, the African Circular uh, Economy Network, uh, all joining us on this journey. Ladies, gentlemen, good afternoon, and welcome to this conversation. 
Good afternoon. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, let me start with you, perhaps, uh, Dobeko. Uh, we, we heard Helen there that the concept of circular design, circular economy is a lot more than just reusing, refurbishing, uh, recycling. Uh, th there's a whole structure and a system to it. Perhaps let, let's give it a little bit more meat for the purposes of people who perhaps are coming across the concept for the first time. Beautiful. Thank you very much, Africa, and uh, for having us. Uh, as, as the introduction said, I'm from African Circular Economy Network. And you are correct. Uh, we usually say circular economy is not about waste management, but resource management. And where that is coming from is there is that misunderstanding that when you talk circular economy, this is another fancy term for recycling. Whereas recycling, it is much late in the system. So if you look at circular economy, it's all about systems thinking. It, All right. Uh, let's hope that's much better. Okay. So, so, so we 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 need to have a systems thinking where, from the onset, you look at the entire system to say what are we trying to do here and what are we trying to achieve. So this is where the design thinking comes into place. When you are designing something, you know what is the life cycle? What are you designing it for? you know, then fit for purpose becomes very important. Because when you talk about recycling, do you really need to design a product that is recyclable? There are products that are meant to be used once, and there are products that are meant not to be used once. So your computers, if, if you look as an example at how quickly we have to change our computers, and, and that is because uh, the world when computers were made, people were making computers, they are making them such that you come back and buy. Now, if we can think systematically and say, do I need to own a computer or do I need to, to use it? And if we can get to that, where when people making computers, you use them, when you are done with it, it goes back to them. So now it becomes their own. So it is in their interest to make sure that this thing lasts forever. After Africa has used it, you can give it to Dobeko, and then he will still use it. But if you don't make it to last that long, it won't. I was going to sort of go to the behavioral question a little bit later, but mm -hmm. you made the example of computers. And of course, a few hours ago, way big reveal by one of the most amazing gadgetry and computer systems company. And everybody's thinking, where can I find the money to buy product A, B, C, D? even though the equivalent versions of it from last year are still functional and they're still fulfilling the purpose that they are fulfilling, there is something magical about being attracted to something new and different. Um, it, it, it talks exactly to that uh, uh, behavior and, and how we have been uh, you know, uh, uh, brought up uh, uh, by society where you know, this thing comes with a status symbol. You know, uh, I've got the latest computer and, and the question should really be then what? Uh, because it does the same thing. It, hence, I am saying it becomes important that we look at fit for purpose. Does it do what it's supposed to be done? In South Africa, where are we in the cycle? Are we, Helene, suggesting very much an early conceptualization and, and, and reception, if you like, of this concept? Um, if I can go back to you know what exactly we, we are trying to achieve. If you look at circular economy, it's an alternative to linear economy, where you, you, you take from the environment, you make, you use, you dispose. And in South Africa, I would say we are in between the two, what we would refer to as a recycling economy, where you make, you recycle, but what you recycle, it will go a couple of loops, but it will still end up in the bin. Uh, circular economy, it is Keep, uh, keeping everything closed. And we understand that is an ideal concept, but what we are saying is let us try and go towards this idealism. So in South Africa, we are still at the recycling stage where you know we are more focusing on waste and not to say that is the wrong approach. It is the correct approach because if you can look at waste within the circular economy, you can refer to it as a low-hanging fruit because this is something that is here, something that you can do something about. Particularly if you can turn it into a wonderful product like we have uh, behind.
behind us. Well, um, Karim, you you based in Kenya, um, and I imagine you, your work is not only focused on the east of the African continent, you're probably exposed to a whole lot of practices around the world, including, of course, Netherlands. Yeah. Um, how are we doing? South Africa yes. or the whole world? Well, both, actually. Let's start <laughs> with South Africa, though. Well, I think I can uh, relate to my colleague. Um, I think we are still in the recycling state um, stage, but that's the same for Kenya, I would say. So the conversation of circularity almost always starts with cleaning up the mess um, before we start talking about design. Um, luckily, when you get people together and you, like for instance in Kenya, I would say, uh, we have quite a clean sheet. So the challenge, there is no infrastructure if we talk about waste management and there are no proper systems in place yet, although the EPR is being developed and now we have just uh, the sustainable waste management bill in place. So those things help and they have included circularity. Um, but it's still, you start from scratch. So the benefit is you start from scratch so you can actually also include how to design. You can start embracing design guidelines for recyclability, you can sit down with people in the space from the recyclers to the brand owners to really understand each other. Um, but the challenge is obviously that you're still in the beginning of um, developing everything and to develop an infrastructure, you need funds and um, uh, a lot of developing countries don't have them. So then it's uh, depending on what the private sector is obliged to do and need to do. So that's how we are in, in Kenya, I would say. And in the Netherlands, with all the respect, so there's great examples in the Netherlands. The Netherlands wants to be circular, fully circular by 2050. Am I correct? Yeah. And there are amazing um, uh, examples of us achieving that or trying to achieve that. But there's also still a bit of, how do I say that, um, transferred issues. Because if you, for instance, develop in Europe, um, uh, we, we, we try to have um, extended producer responsibility on textile now. So that means literally we have it on other uh, materials. So the producer is responsible even beyond the consuming of the good. So if you are responsible as a producer or user of that good, you might likely be... Um, more careful in your design or what you put into the market because you're responsible even to get it back and to make sure it goes back into the loop and you pay levies on that. And the more complicated that is, the higher the levy. So the more complicated the product is to actually um, uh, recover from the environment and to bring back into the loop, the higher the levies would be. So that's the construction of a EPR. Now, if you do that, for instance, in textile in Europe, but we can't recycle clothing yet in Europe. And we um, receive in Kenya, for instance, 30% of everything on secondhand clothing comes from Europe, 30%, of which 50% goes straight to the land, landfill. We can't do anything with it. So imagine if we start collecting more because you're obliged to collect more, where do we now go? So yes, sometimes we look like we have amazing policies coming in place in Europe. Um, my question is always, how do you make that work for other countries as well? Because we have a lot of still um, transferred issues across the globe. Understandably. Um, uh, Saloshni, one of the areas of focus uh, for today's conversation is gonna be around plastics. Why is that important? Why is that important to, to start off with? Okay, so good afternoon, firstly. Um, yeah, and so if you actually take a look around us, plastics are everywhere. Um, they're highly durable, they're convenient to use, they are affordable. So they're here to stay because if you look at it, we use it so often and it has so much value. So that plastics are seen as precious to us. But if you look at this, you can actually see it in a, a tipping balance in a way. So on the one side, you're seeing plastics and all those benefits that it has for society. But on the other side, when you think about plastics, um, it's actually, you would have heard about a lot of the marine litter and its detrimental effect on the environment and on the, o on the ocean. 
um, and as well as, uh, so it's aquatic life that's affected, but also human life. Um, so it has the tipping balance starts swaying on the, uh, the detrimental side. Um, and then also, if you think of it um, globally, we have so much of landfill airspace. And so if you think even in South Africa, if you uh, can actually take materials of value like plastics and put it back into the, the system rather than discarding and you solving that issue of um, using up land, landfill airspace where we may need it for other things that cannot be recycled at this point. Why in South Africa is this still a challenge? We introduced um, a fee to pay for our shopping bags, for example, in the late 90s, didn't we? Uh, well, at least at some point. It feels like I've been paying forever. Um, and the, the idea of collecting uh, plastics and paper was something that was introduced to me when I was in primary school. We would have a challenge at least once a year to see which classroom is going to bring in the most uh, recyclable waste. We then sell it and make money for the school. So it, it seems at the very least that for a few generations now, this has been something that's been in our psyche. Why are we still struggling with this? So, so waste management, and I think Karen actually pointed out some uh, things about the challenges we have. Waste management is, uh, requires recycling and, so, and also changes in the technical processes. And that comes, so this high-tech equipment that's needed for that comes with uh, high financial value for this or high fu funding that's needed. Um, so that's one of the challenges, you won't get it right. In South Africa also, we still have quite a bit of materials going to the landfill and not just being collected as waste. So in, in more middle to high income areas, you'd have more about like say 40%, you'd got proper waste collection systems happening. It's not happening across the country. You'd also see waste management is well managed in uh, metros, the municipalities in the metros. Specifically, uh, a good job's being done in the city of Cape Town and in Kur Kuruleni. Um, other metros, it's maybe, so it's very high percentage, maybe 90% of getting that service delivery right. In the other metros, it's not the case, it's lower percentages. And then, like I said, in the more informal areas, uh, other smaller metros uh, or smaller municipalities, you're not going to see the same uh, results as you see. All right. And we'll unpack the, the pact in a moment. But Kenya has already introduced a pact very yes. similar to, to, to the one we, we're even thinking of in South Africa. How is that going? No, the South African Plastic Pact also exists already, yeah. actually just before ours. Um, so, yeah, how is that going? Um, it's a very, very good concept, the PACT. It's a voluntary initiative. So um, it's a challenge to onboard people that are relevant in the space because what you need is people uh, in a PACT. It's, it's multi-stakeholder. It's, it's sort of a task force, basically. But it consists of brand owners, producers, manufacturers, recyclers, the hospitality industry, retailers. So anyone who deals with plastics and plastics packaging in specific. And um, the power of those packs is, um, so sometimes people say, do I have to? Because you know, you have the question of the businesses asking themselves to what extent am I responsible for sustainability on, on plastics and plastics packaging? But if they do, it's, very, it's a very powerful tool because you actually get solutions or you get um, um, a roadmap, a strategy towards specific targets. So targets, setting targets is, is something that we need to do urgently because otherwise you don't know where you want to go. So if you set targets and you collectively decide, how do I get to those targets? At least you have something you can measure. So you can say, oh, we thought this would lead to meeting those targets, but it doesn't. So you can change direction on the way, but also you have the buy-in. It's not um, a voice of the brand owner saying, we can't change the design because then we can't do the marketing correctly. No, it's a collective of saying, yes, we can change this. The recyclers saying, yes, in the context of Kenya, we can actually deal with these kind of plastics, but this you shouldn't do. So, um, and if you, if you endorse and commit to that collectively, then you have a starting point for transformation. And who takes the lead in this pact? If it's a voluntary onboarding, scenario, so if Africa Milani is manufacturing the product, I then elect to be part of the pact. Who's, who's taking care of it? Like who's, so in who, Kenya, yeah, so in Kenya, Sustainable and Inclusive Business, the organization I work for, 
which is hosted by um, uh, the Kenyan Private Sector Alliance, is the secretariat for that specific pact with technical support and funding from initially from the UK, um, um, but also from the members themselves, so All the right. people that drive. And the South African pact, and excuse me for thinking Kenya had <laughs> theirs before we had ours. <laughs> <laughs> Apologize, South Africa. <laughs> Yes, so um, the Plastic Pact, actually, it's uh, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation actually has a Plastic Pact network. Yeah. So all the Plastic Packs actually fall under this. And it's one of the initiatives for the, the new plastic economy by the, the EMF. Um, so this program for South Africa was actually initiated by WWF South Africa. And they had a bit of support from RAP in the UK as well as um, SAPRO, the South African Producer Responsibility, Responsibility Organization, as well as DFFE. Um, and what happened is, so they initiated, initiated this process and they have a steering committee. And the steering committee actually appointed Green Cape um, as the secretariat of the PAC. So what we do is we facilitate um, the development of a circular economy in the plastic packaging industry by supporting and having a strong focus on not just a single entity, but across the value chain. So this is, um, it's a voluntary agreement as Karen pointed out, and it actually is um, where the members pay a fee towards this um, uh, movement or pact. And what we do is we then support them uh, with technical guidance, with EPR regulations, helping them with that as well as also providing them with direct support. So that's what makes it unique, where you have a collective um, initiatives. You know, you, in many cases, you'd have collective initiatives. But here, you've got one where we're giving them direct support as well. So how we've designed our pact is we don't just have, um, as a secretariat, to give our members the maximum benefit. We, we have different focus uh, or umbrellas. So we have a, st uh, a st stakeholder management one where we, we work directly with the members. We see how we can support them. We have a technical space where we look specifically at the, the technical challenges they have, the EPR challenges. Um, we also have, so we have supporting members. So we're bringing together everyone within the value chain. So it's not just the industry players, which are the, the retailers and the brand owners. It's bringing in government, academia as well. And then we also look at consumer behavior studies. Another key area that we have is the comms area. So there's the stakeholder management, there's a technical space, and there's comms as well. And this is because we can bring about a message, getting the messaging right, not just to the industry players, but across the entire value chain, which is from extraction right down to final end user, everybody is brought into this process. And I think I just want to point out that's what circular design is about. It's taking that scale from where we once went and we only focused on building a product. Now, we, then it suddenly moved to businesses and their bottom line. And now the thing is looking across the entire ecosystem. So that's where the holistic uh, approach comes into play, as well as the um, collaborative effect, uh, yeah, approach. And Domego, uh, if we're doing it in plastics, can't we do it in all other forms of waste management? Um, <clears throat> it, it can. It can be done, and, and, and that's what we, we, we should be doing. And um, I think for me, the why becomes very important. Why, why are we doing things the way we are doing them? Why do we need the change? If you can put up the first slide, I think it talks uh, to, to the why. Because there's something called F overshoot day. So all these clever people that come up with these calculations, they say every year, because uh, nature is so generous, it gives us resources for us to live for that year. And because of our behavior and the way we consume things, the example in Kenya of textiles being coming to Kenya from Europe, uh, it happens in Nigeria. Nigeria is struggling with plastics. In Ghana, it's e-waste. So that is because of how we consume. So this tells us that Qatar is the worst 
campaign, I mean, a, 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 a country in terms of behavior, because what they are given for the year, by the 9th of February, it's finished. So everything they do, it's borrowed from the following years. So, so, so that's why we have issues of climate change. We've got the problems that we have uh, in the world. South Africa, it's not doing very well. Uh, around July, we are finishing ours. Uh, Indonesia is the best, 18th of July. And, and if you can go to the next slide, then it says it's not all doom and gloom. Something happened in 2020, and we have reversed that behavior. And what happened in 2020 was the first close, uh, a lockdown. So now you are locked down, you are not eating as much or eating what you would like. I know in South Africa, uh, alcohol and cigarettes were the big problem. So, you know, if you look at how they are being produced, how much water you use, how much energy you use to produce all these things, now we are not eating them or consuming them as much as we would. So it says lockdown is actually an eye-opener, which says we can change our behavior. We can change how we do things. So, so, so that, is, that is very important. And it can be applied in, in, in all way streams. Uh, extended producer responsibility. Uh, we've got it in South Africa now. It talks to plastics, it talks to packaging, it talks to e-waste. And I think the very first one was the waste tires, where you know we've got this system where you can collect waste tires. The importers and the manufacturers of, 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 of tires, they pay a levy, and that levy is used to deal with tires when they become waste. So it can be done in all the waste streams, but what is important is why are we doing it? And, and when you talk about circular economy, we really look at three things. We look at the economy itself. Uh, uh, it, it is not something that needs to sit in the offices that deal with the environment. It's business. Yeah. So we need yeah. to change from doing business as usual. So there are economic benefits in, 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 in circular economy because it makes you competitive. And it also says we need to make sure that in what we do, the, the society, it prospers. And then we protect and regenerate our environment. So I, I think that is where it sometimes gets missed because big business, they have big impact. That's why you know, we talk about brand owners in this conversation because they have the power to make things happen. So as soon as they see that there is value in my bottom line, then it is going to be easy. How, firstly, who are those brand owners? Let's, you know, don't have to name them, but mm. just mm. where do they generally exist? And what advocacy work needs to be done to persuade them to go, let's shift, let's reimagine, let's, mm. because the, the pandemic, as you quite rightly alluded to, was a forced crisis that forced us to look at different ways of how we consume and behave. Mm. And now we're seemingly going back to the normal ways, right? Um, and yet there was value in that. I don't want to be locked in my space and not moving for the amount of time I was forced. Don't get me wrong. But it did make me think, do I need to be as indulgent in my lifestyle in traveling the distances I do to just go and enjoy a steak uh, and some chips, right? Because you, you're thinking of the the reward of mm, amazing mm. and not thinking of the damage that you are creating to mm. the environment in that mm. process. Mm. And, and, and I like that you, 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 you touched on the reward. I think that is where really it, it lies. What is it for me as business to do this? I mean, in the discussion that we had uh, 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 yesterday, uh, talking about plastics, the, the example of a brand owner that has got different colored caps in their milk because you are able to identify from the cap that is, this is full cream, this is low fat, this is that, that. But if you look at different colors when this thing becomes waste, it makes it difficult to recycle. And something happened uh, and, and, and all of a sudden there were white caps and people did not really notice. They were, still, they were still able to pick the milk that they want because it is written anyway, but the, 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 the brand owner or the business want to make things easy because you are in this shelf and you are competing with the other products that are there. So what, what, what is going to make me 
you know, uh, 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 come out brighter in that shelf than ev everyone else. So, so, so the thinking is there. We then need to say and do these tests to say if you actually do this change, it makes no difference. And, you know, even them, you know, making different colored things, it's much more expensive than making one color. So this is where now then you see this talks to their bottom line and then we onboard everyone. Karim, that resonates, right? Because if I'm a CEO of a major brand that is having my product consumed and I'm making profits, and you're trying to convince me to join the pact, for example, it needs to still make business sense for me over and above other moral senses that you're trying to sell it. Yeah, it does resonate. Okay, there, there's for me two, two sides of this story. So yes, I see that in practice in the Kenyan Plastic Pact as well where some uh, change to transparent bottles for dairy, so for milk, for instance. And if they are the only one, then the sales drop because people can see milk. And milk, <coughs> consumers are funny creatures. We're all humans, so we're very funny in how we perceive things and what will motivate us. And so you can see a little bit of, how do you call that? Like traces of milk. It's not like, yeah, you know, it's shakes, etc. So they literally lost sales. So yeah, that doesn't really work. Then they go back to slightly transparent. So uh, there's another side of this story I, I still want to address because convincing every business that their bottom line won't change and that everyone can be happy, um, that discussion we also we need to turn in to a different direction as well. Um, because going from a linear economy to a circular economy won't be a a gentle transition. I don't believe in that. It needs, it requires a whole transformation, a whole system change. You can't change one element in the value chain and then stay relevant. It won't work. It, it just won't work. So also because we're still measuring with our old value set, like it is not cheaper to recycle. There's no one who's going to tell you at the moment, yeah, no, it's really a business benefit because I didn't use virgin materials. According to our old value set, you recycle is more expensive than a virgin material. Why is that? Why? Because we haven't done proper pricing. It's not cheaper. We damage the environment is not calculated in a virgin price of plastic. We, we actually, um, uh, we, we really use resources that we don't have. They're finite. They're not infinite. So we don't calculate the negative impact on people, the negative impact on environment. We don't calculate that. The, the, the whole bottom line is, a, is not a true price of a product. So a t-shirt is the same. I mean, a conventional cotton t-shirt takes, I don't know how many thousands of liters of water to produce. And organic is much less water, but organic is much more expensive. And so we keep on pushing that. So our value set, our monetary value set is not based on the impact we have on the environment and on people. Because the other element we forget is that we say, yeah, for the environment, the environment will live. It's us in the end. People don't realize we've placed ourselves on top of the ecosystem, but we are just a mammal. We're just people with image. The only difference is we can imagine and we can create um, like, so, so without an incentive yet, yet there, without proof there, we started hunting, we started doing things, we, we start creating things that might lead to an innovation, but we don't know if it's successful, we're still doing it. But we are just part of nature and, um, and we forget that. So ultimately, you know, like even growing conventional cotton is much worse for the farmer's health uh, in the end as well. It's not only bad for the environment and that's with everything we do like also the plastic, so the choices. So for me, yes, I think to create, to sort of tackle that issue of businesses need to make money, yes, they need to make money. We need to have policies in place that push you to do the right things. You can't do it without. You need to have also pushing uh, policies. You need to have a tax waiver on uh, recycled content, recycled materials, recycled machineries. You need to push that. Uh, in doing good. Um, and the same in Kenya, we have, um, if you have those pellets made out of organic waste instead of charcoal, a lot of people still cook on charcoal. 
Um, so we, we, not only do you save trees, you also solved organic waste problem. Uh, it's healthier because it doesn't give you the smoke, so it's much healthier. A lot of issues of respiratory diseases come from unhealthy cooking in, in uh, developing countries. And yet, those pellets are very expensive. Secondly, but, but, but they're not is, part is of the not, value chain. Is it not a case of uh, unit cost? So if you're producing bulk of that and little of that, the unit cost of this is going to be much smaller than the unit cost of that. Is it, is it a case of we're just not simply producing enough in volumes to bring down the unit cost of those pellets? That is normally the excuse, but it's not completely true. So let me also be positive because I sound very negative. <laughs> but we need to start moving. And for that move, we can't use the same economic value. You can't say it's not worth it. You know, we need to invest in that transition, in that transformation. We really need to invest in it. So it's not, it's not cheaper because the machinery you need to produce the pellets, um, to log into the system and say, to create commitment in a distribution <coughs> channel to say, oh yeah, now instead of finding the charcoal on the side of the road, the pellets are everywhere. It needs time to evolve. It needs also commitment, like what we see in the in a plastic pact, for instance. Their strength again is, if you come up with an innovation and say, Let's, let me choose that change of material, change of plastic, it will only work if you also get commitment of a brand owner saying, okay, I'm going to choose that material for the next coming two years. Then we don't have the volume issue. Now you can test it, you can do it. For two years you have that commitment. And that's why we need to work together. So you need consumers that are aware, you need a push from policy, and then you need to work as the private sector in the value chain with, with, um, yeah, with the right investments and motivation yeah. to pick them. And I imagine solution, it becomes a slightly difficult thing to manage because we have an economy that is not growing at the rate that we'd like it to grow and therefore producing enough people in the middle class who will have that voice and that choice and that agency to be able to say, I simply refuse to consume A because it is not made of organic material, renewable material, whatever the case may be. But what are these success stories in South Africa? What are we celebrating in this space? Um, in terms of the plastic space? Or in, in uh, for example, or more broadly, the circular economy. So, okay, so I do want to say, so the, the plastic pact is a success story, and I've mentioned that, but I also want to say when you think of uh, materials going to the landfill, so. I can think of opportunities for us and some of the success stories we have there. And one space is um, organic waste. So if you think of our um, Cape Town landfill, we've got 14% um, of plastics going there, right? Plastics waste, but 25% of organic waste, which is food waste and, and, and things like that. So when you think of that, so um, some of the solutions, so that creates a, um, if you think of, food security issues we have and climate change, one of the good things is seeing how can we use that opportunity of diverting organic waste. And so there are initiatives like the Black Flo uh, Soldier Fly Initiative. So this is actually a insect that is not your typical fly that feeds on organic waste and it has a high protein value but it also has uh, a lot of other materials that are functional for, um, so at the moment it's used for pet food um, and livestock, feeding livestock. So that actually is a big market in South Africa and that is a success story where we are actually the hub of the black soldier fly industry. So I don't know. Am, am I going to consider that for my dinner at some um, point? <laughs> at the moment there isn't for human consumption. I've okay. heard international st studies people are working on that, but in South Africa it's largely... I was, I was just asking. <laughs> I, was, I was just asking. But it's food for your steak. Yes. Mm. yes. You, so, it's so it's alternative protein food. So instead yeah. of feeding um, animals proteins with little fish yeah. Yes. Now so yeah. you dive, yeah, you actually, that's where the food security, so by having this source of protein created, you can actually, that source of fish can be used elsewhere where you would need to feed um, human. Uh, human exactly. uh, it's now time to turn to your questions. I don't know if Joe Stend is in the house. Is Joe here? 
Um, perhaps not. I will then ask his questions because he had some really, really good questions. Um, Joe, in fact, is, well, is with one of the big uh, corporations. Um, asking, how do we effectively develop systems to support secularity? Uh, the ideology is clear, but we have so many processes that are outdated and needs urgent redesign. This is causing considerable resistance to an effective, swift transition. Even focusing on launching products with a minimum viable solution tends to lose momentum. I should say he's in the food space. Mm. She. Oh, she. Sorry. Yes. Sorry. Apologies, Joe. <laughs> Spelled J-O-E. Yes, yes. <laughs> so I should English say um, Joe actually is representing uh, one of the the retailers that, oh, the brands that sit within the South African plastic pack. <laughs> oh, fantastic. And would you like to, to uh, speak to know. some of the yeah. issues that Joe raises, anyone? Um, I, I, I can um, <laughs> step on that. Um, you know, the development of systems is, is really very important. And um, there is policy uh, involved, there is business, and then there is society. So. This, this becomes a systems. Um, I think a, a very good example was made of, are we using the correct measurements to measure things that we are measuring? You've mentioned our economy is not growing as it should, but how are we, how are we measuring this economy? We're using GDP. Is GDP the correct measure uh, 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 for us to get to where we want to be? Because uh, if, if, if you look at, at, at how we behave, we behave on how we are being measured. There are interesting measures that, you know, uh, recently came up uh, as a result of load shedding where there is something now called the happiness index. You know, how happy are we as South Africans? Um, because secular economy as a system, it talks not to one part, but it talks to the entire system. Economically, we must be doing very well. We must make money. But what do we do with this money? This money must make society better. And, and, and this money must also make sure that we, we, we regenerate uh, our environment. I like the example of a black uh, soldier flag because what it does, it takes what would go to landfill and produce methane gas, which is going to increase the climate change. It converts it into protein. Without this black soldier fly, what was the protein? The protein was the fish from a fish meal. Where do you get it? You have to go deep into the sea to fish, and there is transporting. You've mentioned that Joe is coming from the food space. Um, also, the, the, the systems that we are living with, South Africa produces 10.1 million tons of food waste every year. Which... It's another thing I don't understand, given the number of people who go hungry every day in this country. And there's 20 million of those people. And, and that is a very good example to say, how do we look at the food system and make sure that we correct it? Mm -hmm. Now, we, we, we grow up in a society where you need veggies, you must go and get them from the shop. The shops get them from the market. So you've got a small farmer which talks to this economy of scale where organic stuff it's more expensive because the, you don't have numbers. Because anything that you're going to distribute, it's a numbers game. You will have a small farmer that is growing veggies. The first thing that comes to mind is I must take my veggies to the market. Whereas, you know, circular economy is about disrupting. It's about keeping things local because when you transport, in that transporting, you are emitting a, 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 a greenhouse gases. That's why we've got that picture in 2020 because people were not traveling. People were not flying as much as they would. Uh, so that's what we need to, to do, to say, if I make something, before I take it to the mainstream, what is referred to the mainstream economy, I want my product to be on the shelf. Why can't I start selling to my neighbor? And then you, you, my neighbors might buy all my produce uh, before I need to go back. So, so, so this, this, that, that is the system. And that talks to policy, it talks to businesses, uh, it talks to everyone, human, uh, uh, the consumers, to say wh what is it that we can do differently. But do they take it one bite size at a time? So instead of looking at the entire organization, I mean, Karin, I agree with you. If you're going to revolutionize, just like 
not quite burn down everything and start from scratch, but <laughs> revolutionize everything. Right? I absolutely get that. Mm. But this is a massive, massive food group. Mm. It's the bureaucracy alone to unpack that is mm. probably going to take systems, philosophy, paradigm shifts. Mm. But do you take it, let's take this unit first. Let's extend it to that region. Mm. Let's extend it, is that how they do it at the organization? Um, that, that is, to me, you know, uh, the best way to do it. Because if, if I can go back to the example of a small farmer, uh, you are competing with a multinational uh, a corporate farmer. You cannot compete in, in, in their terms. You, you, you cannot compete by taking your, 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 your produce uh, 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 to the market because there are regulations, which is uh, uh, what you are talking about, to say how do we deal with this bureaucracy. You know, you do not have the money to invest in the labeling that is required uh, by, the, by, the, by the produce. But you are probably producing, you know, the, the most delicious and healthy potato, but your potatoes come in different sizes because you don't have the technical controls that you need to produce a certain size of potatoes that is needed by the market. So... It, 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 it is really a mind shift. You know, even you as a consumer, uh, uh, to say this potato is actually as good as, as, as the other potato. I think somewhere in Europe, there was a, a company that looked at deformed uh, 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 fruits and veggies. Because when you go to the store, you are looking for this beautiful round apple. But if the apple is not as round, you know, you think there's something wrong with it. And there is a lot of those that are coming out of the of the of the of the market. Uh, you know, the 10.1 million tons of waste that we produce every year. Most of it comes from when you know uh, the food is being distributed, the food is being uh, uh, graded. So there are these grades that don't fit the market requirements, and they get thrown away. Whereas they can be taken and they can still be used, but they are not fit for someone's shelf, yeah. but they Which are fit for your kitchen. Yes. Uh, a question from Mpumi. Mpumi is with Story Vibe Productions. How can you bring consciousness narratives through innovative products closer to the everyday person? I'm not sure who wants to pick up that question. I think it's, um, yeah, that, that is a lot to do with getting that message out there. And I think, uh, like I said, within, so when we look at the plastic pact as an example, we've got a strong focus on the communication strategy. What are the messages out there for the, the, the direct members involved in this? What are the messages out there for um, the stakeholders, uh, other stakeholders like government and um, academia? And then also consumers, what is the messages that the consumers, what, what can they do? Um, and then I think we actually just yesterday on Tobacco's team and, and myself, uh, our team actually had a discussion. We've got a lot of information across all the spheres on circular economy and how do we translate that message. Um, so I think that's where ASIN had come about and th they had looked to see how they can actually support by looking at all the different um, spheres where we're working in the circular economy and how they can actually translate that narrative through their platforms. So I don't know if you want to add on. Uh, uh, definitely, I'd like to add on that. And, um, you know, together with the Dutch Development Agency, we are on phase two of what we refer to as Secular South Africa. Uh, if I can touch on your question to say, how do we do this thing? Do we do it in stages? And there is a lot of pockets of excellence in South Africa where people are doing really beautiful things. So what we are trying to achieve as Secular South Africa is to say, let us create a platform where anyone you know, who does something in the secular economy space, we are able to get together, we are able to share ideas, we are able to say, how do we combine the little efforts that we do such that they've got a bigger impact? So that is one of the ways you know we can make sure that everyone is brought on board everyone understands where we want to be because at some point when we talk secular economy it still sounds like something that goes above people's head whereas it is actually 
the the most real thing, especially when it comes to the continent of Africa, because it is how we have been doing things for years. As ASEN, we've got presence and, and, and representation in about 42 out of the 54 countries in the continent. So we get to see these case studies and, and you know, we get to appreciate that circular economy actually is not about learning new things. It's about remembering where we come from and unlearning, you know, all the wrong things that we have learned. Uh, we talk about plastics. You've mentioned plastic bags, where we had to pay a levy for plastic bags. But in the African concept, there is a concept of a market, where each and every home behind the door, there is a basket. And that is a market basket. When you go to the market, you take that basket, you go to the market, and then you, you come back, you put your basket behind the door again. Now we, get, we have shops that come with reusable plastics and we look at this thing as something that is new. It is, it is how we have been doing these things. All we need to do is to remember and unlearn the wrong things that we have learned. Absolutely. Uh, Karina, I think I'll give this one to you. This is from Ukola from Organic Matters asking what are the policies the South African government can implement that we can learn from the Kingdom of the Netherlands? Yeah, I think what would be very helpful is, um, and they're not only from the Netherlands, but also from, because we're part of the EU. So we see, um, for instance, a policy on eco-design, um, which actually doesn't allow you anymore as a producer to produce things that are not durable, that don't last, that can't extend their lifespan. And also, for instance, um, uh, on all that, like, Eco design is also have the same kind of wires, for instance, for different electronic products. That um, makes so yeah, no, it's helpful. crazy. Every new model you have a new wire. So so and wires are actually really hard to recycle. Uh, so <clears throat> that's on a different note. So the policies that we can learn from um, leverage on the what we've learned on EPRs definitely and waste management infrastructure in Europe. Um, but especially on eco-design, on really looking at how do you design for durability. Um, and at the same time also with the, with the new rules and reporting standards coming in place in Europe on sustainability, I think um, it makes you reassess and reflect on your business where you are and where you collectively want to go. And I hope South Africa can incorporate um, those kind of policies as well. And another thing is, I think, what I would like maybe not to adopt exactly like from Europe, because sometimes um, it's hard to really just copy, um, copy the same policies. In Kenya, we copy everything from the UK because of uh, the past there. Um, so it's even saying, like, we do this according to British standards, um, but they come sometimes really copy. So I would, I would really... Um, like to push for, be inspired by some of the policies, but make them Africanized, make them work for your local context, and make African standards count. I think we need to push as a continent much harder for those kind of uh, policies that we do keep in place, or labels like made in Africa, that should count, uh, even on, on vegetables, fruits, etc. I think we sometimes need to push that our standards are working for our continent and they're being tested and they should be approved. And, and Particularly with the Africa Free Continental Trade Agreement area that yeah. is um, certainly at an advanced stage of finalization actually. I mean that's yeah. something that could be used to really, really get Africans behind African made product. Absolutely, absolutely. I, um, I have high expectations because they even address intellectual property in that um, African, so then you go also back to traditional knowledge that now sometimes is just being grabbed, but um, we have beautiful traditional knowledge that also should, the benefits of sharing that and the benefits of using that should also benefit our continent back again. Yeah. And I think just to add one thing to that last question, is my thing working? I don't yeah. know. Um, is that if you look at, I would love to preach for a circular society because if we're patching up a current economy, 
The current economy is linear. We will keep on patching that up and keep on living with that GDP, keep on living with those kind of value sets. We're going not really somewhere because we need to go round. So we need to thrive and then we need to just become food for other cycles of life, etc. There's no eternal growth. Like growth is the holy grail of our current linear economy. And it's, it, it is so, um, it, it, it's, it destroys everything because it doesn't exist. So it only makes a few richer, but it doesn't, it doesn't create that cycle. So we need to make sure that we thrive and that um, the current economy only exists because we overproduce and overconsume. And because that cycle, we want to keep that alive, that's how we design. And see, in your idea, a 0.4 percentage economy increase then would not be such a bad headline. No, I would preach for a cap on profits even. What's the point of a CEO making uh, 3 million a year? What are you going to, is there no limit to it? Why would we make, why would you have billions and billions? What are you going to spend it on? Look at Microsoft and then what is he doing? Now he's handing out little funds, $100,000. <laughs> but he's deciding on what, eh? So let's not... <laughs> no, I, I, I think there needs to be a cap. There is an, um, an, an economist within the UN from America, and even they are saying that, like, maybe you can be as rich as you can support three generations <laughs> beyond in a very nice and pleasant way. We all want to live in a nice and pleasant way. <laughs> but there's, 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 why not a cap? I mean, what's the purpose of making money only for shareholders? What's the purpose? What, why? Are there economists in the house who can answer that question for us? No one is uh, putting, uh, <laughs> no one, okay. Uh, here's a practical question from Nadia. Uh, Nadia is with Grounded. Asking, does every aspect of the product we make have to be reused or recycled in order for it to qualify as a circular design? Um, or is there an extent to which you can combine new elements into this design with the old? I don't know who wants to take that. I, I can just quickly. That's a great example. No, you don't have to have everything uh, recyclable and, and not combined with innovation. So for instance, if you look at one stage of circular economy where you say we refurbish, but design for refurbish, first you design, like a computer, we were talking about that. I just had that. I was not working for two days because my computer crashed. But repairing that computer costs more than buying a new one. Correct. Um, which is insane. So, But if you had design, so there's examples from the Netherlands, for instance, we have Fairphone. That phone is designed to, the minute you have upgrades on software or your battery won't last because we can't design a battery that lasts that long, um, then you just replace that component. So replace that one component with a new component. Um, so I would say, no, it's definitely not essential to make sure that everything is recycled, uh, especially with technology, it's going to be quite hard, but at least allow it to be repaired refurbished and ultimately remanufactured. So let all the elements be brought back to resources and then you create still a new product for yeah. it. And then the next couple of questions are very much education focused. And I, I don't know how, what your specialization in education <laughs> is, but I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna ask the questions anyway. Um, how, how do we start awareness of the circular design cycle on tertiary education level? Uh, introductory as part of a course perhaps in the future of design is a question asked by Rene Rousseau of Rene Rousseau Studios. That's we have very nice examples in the Netherlands, to be honest. So I, I'm here also based in Cape Town, so not only in Kenya, working with a local team here um, uh, from the Rock Group, and we provide education on academia level on circular economy, so majors and minors, as well as on the relationship between nature and people, so nature and human relations. Um, but we see a lot in the Netherlands, a lot of the curriculums, um, especially in this, I love that topic. Um, so the art school in the Netherlands has already a whole track that is called creative transformation. So as an 
artist in the Netherlands, you can follow that track. And it's catering towards what we're discussing about today. Yeah, yeah and that's, and I think, um, yeah, you should uh, definitely offer it, but I also see that in the younger generation, there's much more appetite for it. There's much more need for presenting it. And what we saw with the Donut Economy, the book written um, uh, by, is she a professor in the UK? She had been questioned, she was an economist, and, and students don't accept that old approach towards an economy anymore. They ask you beyond. So I think it's time we offer it everywhere and anywhere. So, you to go yeah, yes, I, I did want to say from a South African perspective, we are doing it. So Prof. Harrow from Blotnitz, he's not actually here, but he'd be able to answer very well because they do have it at UCT. Um, it's probably more part of postgraduate studies. Um, I did my master's in technology and innovation management um, at the University of Pretoria. And we actually had, it was coursework and a dissertation. So my dissertation was focused on sustainability transition, so much of what we spoke about today. So it is happening. Um, they also have courses that are specifically on like techno-economics and the circular economy. So they're starting to introduce it. What is lacking, it wasn't offered at the undergrad level as well as at the honors level. So I think it is very critical that we bring it in much earlier in the, yeah. the curriculum. Yeah. Yes. Which is what Erica de Clare from the African Fashion Research Institute uh, then says, that the shift to thinking circular is urgent and curriculum reform is very slow. So, so there needs to be a better yeah. dance, if you like, yes. in that process. Hey. So if you see in our, um, recently our education system, we, there's, I think there's supposed to be the implementation of a few added areas in the fields of robotics and AI, amongst other things, as well as problem solving. I'm not sure if it's been brought in as yet, but I do know they've, they were carrying out pilot studies for that, and it should have been rolled out into the, the basic education system already. Uh, Debego, I'll give you the finance question. Uh, we, uh, just about everybody has brought up the issue of funding and how expensive this entire exercise is going to be, and you need to find somebody who's going to be inspired enough, incentivized enough, whatever the case may be, to, to do the right thing. Uh, the question from Piwe from MWC, uh, what methods can we use to incentivize governments and financial issues into investing into the circular economy? Um, you, you, you are correct. Uh, that is one of the topics that we are grappling with, uh, to say how do we finance circular economy? Because it is, it is a new thing. Uh, it is going to disrupt. It is out of the ordinary. There would be, uh, you know, capex that is needed for some of, 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 of the things that we need uh, to do to implement that. It, it, it talks to policy. Uh, you would also now see the, the, the funding institutions, especially the banks, they are uh, 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 looking into that to say, if you bring a project, you know, what does it do to the environment? What does it do to the, to the society? You know, is it secular? Is it, is it the term that is being used is, is now, is it sustainable? And, and if you look at, you know, circular economy, it's part of sustainability. How do we make sure that the things we do, they are not damaging to the environment and to the people uh, because we are part of the environment. So there needs to be uh, uh, some policy shift and, and, and also businesses, I think they understand that now, the businesses that are in the funding space, that this is important. Uh, it is for the better good. Uh, so let's try and, and push everyone towards that. So it is that understanding that the funding needs to make sure that things that are sustainable in nature, they get priority. And we are there. Can, can they make it exclusively that? Uh, there was a move at some point where the banks were not going to be financing fossil fuels mm, mm. in energy um, mm. um, uh, production, for example, mm. which... which I'm not sure whether it shifted or not, but that's a good mm. thing, and that was a good decision. Mm. Could something similar be made? That unless you, you showcase and demonstrate mm. how you are either transitioning to or mm. you are squarely part of the circular economy, we will not be financing whatever your upcoming projects. 
Uh, policy then becomes very important there because we've got this beautiful uh, uh, constitution in South Africa, I think the longest chapter, chapter two, Bill of Rights. Uh, are you, will you pass the constitutional test if you make it exclusive? And that then needs to have a policy support because of where we are going as a country. I think uh, there is a lot of billions that have been pledged to assist South Africa to move away from fossil fuel to renewable energy. So, so, so that, you know, and if you look at the IPPs that the Department of Minerals and Energy is, is, is pushing, so there has been an agreement at the policy level. So it would need that support. I don't think as an individual you can say if you don't tick this box, you can, you can pass because, you know, people can take you on on that. But that is a good idea, but it needs a policy support. All right. Uh, next week, not next week, next month, rather, at the, at the next uh, Creative Exchange Dialogue, we'll be focusing on fashion, for example, and tourism, and how the circular economy can help uh, in that space. Um, uh, can it work? Can a pact similar to what you guys were talking about in the plastics space, particularly, but waste management space, could a pact similar to that work in industries outside, like fashion, like tourism? Absolutely. I think it's a great concept because of what I said earlier, um, you bring all the different people together in that specific sector um, and then you set collective targets and then you create collectively a strategy to meet those targets. So you have a lot of buy-in, you have a lot of voice and if you collectively find that the, the, the right activity to do, you're probably also more likely to mobilize resources because you can say and the NGO WWF and the civil society and the brand owners and the private sector, we all think this is the right thing to do. So I think, it, and it will also speed up um, conversations. I mean, there's always like, let's start acting and not talking. But there's a lot of things that we don't know yet. Like a linear economy also causing a lot of um, the whole value chains are always chopped up in little pieces. And no one knows exactly what is, what is happening on the beginning of a value. Like when you're wearing um, uh, a piece of cloth, you, you often don't think about the farmer or the person who was extracting oil because you were wearing synthetic cloth. So it's a long way. So to actually understand what happens and where you can improve and what is needed. So if you know, one great innovation, that's nice, but it needs to anchor somewhere. So if it's a loose innovation, um, the chances that it will be successful are slim. Now, if you can just say, listen, okay, then it belongs there, and we commit to try and make this innovation or this change uh, work, then that would, that would help. So I think it would be great, yeah. Because both you, uh, Sudeshni and Dabego, made the point, a lot of this is above the heads of ordinary South Africans in this case, <laughs> right? And I imagine it would be the same across the continent and in many parts of the world. As a consumer, I just need to know that I'm consuming the right product. I, I, I mean, I will learn because I'm interested and this is the nature of my work, but the overwhelming majority of society will not have the capacity, nor the time, perhaps not even the interest, sadly, to learn about all and going, let me consume the right product because they are part of this economy. Yeah. Well, we just need to get it right. Yes. <laughs> so that when I am consuming a product, I know that this is the right product for me to be consuming right yeah. now. So I just want to add on that uh, the retail for clothing, textile, footwear, and leather master plan that South Africa has uh, in place, it never actually considered the circular economy or actually anything on sustainability. Uh, sustainability. So with WWF and again RAP, they have been looking how they can actually roll out uh, a textile pact as well. So go a very similar movement like this um, to bring about that circular textile uh, um, industry um, or yeah, vision. And then also to note that the master plan is now very just very recently, like I said, they've introduced a pillar of sustainability. So I think that's a very big step in the right direction to see this sort of change happening because yeah. it comes from that high level already or it yeah. will come from that level. Absolutely. But okay. I think you're right. We need to communicate in a very simple way because even on 
I'm working on the pack, you're working on the pack, you have all those codes like recyclability, six, number five, one, the, I don't even know it and I'm working in this space. Now, how do you know even? And also plastic is not always plastic to yes. be recycled. So this is plastic with a bit of paper, but it looks like plastic, but we don't know. So I agree with you. We also, towards consumers, it needs to be crystal clear. It needs yes. to be, and also it needs to be trusted, trustworthy because I hope I buy organic stuff, but I can't test it. You know, I hope <laughs> that there has no preservatives, but I don't really know. You know, you need glasses to read the... the I, I mean, I it's just... <laughs> I just went to an olive grove in a trip that I was in and the things I learned about olive oil. And we yeah. assume that one labeled that costing us an excessive amount of money yeah. is actually the healthiest, the greenest, but it's not. No. It's, it's riddled with problems, but yeah. just sold in a very... So, so it's very <laughs> scary. It's very scary. And in the end of the day, you either don't eat because and you will die, or you do eat, but all the wrong stuff and you still die. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yes, um, I, I just want to add on, on, on the, the question of simplifying these things. And, um, you know, if I can touch on your previous question about how do we introduce this as curricula at tertiary institutions. For me, that will probably be late. You know, we need to include it in basic education. You've made an example of robotics. I mean... The, the amazing things that these young kids are doing with robotics, you know, are unbelievable. So that is what we need to do. You know, um, in, in, in a just uh, transition to secular economy uh, a workshop that we had, a professor from UCT made a very important point to say, why don't we have a secular economy show? Like you would have cooking shows on TV. Uh, you know, let's have that on TV such that it becomes... The, 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 the concept that is communicated constantly in the mainstream media. So, so that is where we need uh, to be. And also understand that it is going to take time. It's not going to be an overnight yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. So it's very important that we start it at a basic education level such that these leaders of the future, when they become consumers, they consume much better than us. And I always make an example of strawberries. We grow strawberries in South Africa but for a short period of time. And you get specials, you know, everywhere during the strawberry season. But when that ends, we import strawberries and we start buying expensive strawberries. A simple thing that we need to ask ourselves, can I live for a certain period without eating strawberries? And if the answer is yes, and every one of us, stops eating strawberries when South Africa is not producing strawberries. We will stop importing strawberries because that distance, you know, it contributes to greenhouse emissions. Mm -hmm. So you are correct. We need to communicate it simply and make examples such as those. And if it is constantly in your lounge, we will get somewhere. But then the finance minister will tell you <laughs> you can't export citrus to Saudi Arabia so that they can consume it whenever they want it because we're producing extra citrus in South Africa. And by the way, the A-grade orange goes overseas. Mm. We, even your Lani supermarket has a B-grade orange, not the A-grade orange. I literally went into a hotel room in Saudi Arabia and it was the most beautiful, most juicy, most round, most orange thing I've ever tasted. Mm. And I went, where is this from? And they said, Cape Town. <laughs> yeah. I went, I've never tasted orange as good in Cape Town because all the best ones are exported. So if we're not going to be importing uh, strawberries, and I agree with you, we don't need, only need strawberries around Wimbledon. You don't need it another time. Um, <laughs> that's the reality. Um, but if we're not importing strawberries, we then eat we oranges. should not be willing to export anything. And then that messes up the economy and then we need to rethink it in many ways. Mm. Yeah. Let me ask this as a parting question, then you can include your thoughts here. Uh, the majority of people in the room, and I imagine tuning in, are people who are working in small and medium enterprises, which I believe are the solution to our economic problems in South Africa, truly, without a doubt. If we invest in them more, if we take care of them better, if we nurture them, we'll actually see the kind of economic growth applying the linear economy uh, elements that will address some of the socioeconomic challenges we're facing in this country. They're looking here thinking, wait a minute, we're working with product that is available, we're reusing, we're repurposing, we're refurbishing, we're recycling, 
we want to be part of the circular economy. What inspiration are you leaving them with today? And I'll start with you. Inspiration. <laughs> um, I think for me the inspiration is that change begins with all of us. And it is very clear messaging today that for this to work and for us to transition to a circular economy, it begins with you to make that change. All right. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. I think, yeah, I would say um, for them to be inspired, I think we need to just reconnect, even on educational level, on business level, because we need to ask ourselves the questions again, why are we doing what we're doing and what are we using to do so. So we, we lost that whole concept. So and in the circular economy for small, medium enterprises and startups, there are many there are many different business models that are very interesting and that actually um, for instance rental models or from product to service. In the Netherlands we had an architect working with, with uh, Philips Lighting and said, I don't want light bulbs. I don't want to buy light. I don't want it. I want light in my building. I didn't ask, you know, it's the same for if you buy a broccoli. You didn't ask it to be wrapped in all sorts of things. I wanted just the broccoli. That's what you ultimately want to access. Same for light. So I think if you really look out of the box for new business models that are um, available within a circular economy, it's, that's very inspiring. And the last thing is connection, because education is not about telling people things, but just understanding that the desk you, you work on in your school is made out of a tree, that the milk doesn't come from the supermarket but from the cow, that the strawberry came from the field but it's not there now because it's winter. So we, we don't know, we don't know what is an indigenous vegetable, uh, you know, where's the avocado coming? You, you don't even ask yourself what you're eating, where's it coming from, this table, was a tree, metal. So I think that is what we need to restore and for businesses to develop new business models that are very interesting. All right, thank you. Um, talking about small businesses, I always like the why. If, if we can go to the next slide. Um, ESCOM, a <laughs> company that was established in the 1920s, it is now struggling. So innovation is very important, uh, doing things differently. Now, the next thing that is coming is water. Uh, we have people dying in Amanskra. And um, our water system is is shown on the on the on the on the screen there. It it the, the fit for purpose becomes very important in South Africa and globally. We are committing one of the biggest crimes. This was borrowed from one of the briefings from Green Cape, where we're saying we use everything for potable water, whereas we need potable water for drinking, washing, and cooking small portion and everything goes to waste. What is happening in Amanskral, it's because of Royval Wastewater Treatment Works that is not treating water effectively, it goes into the drinking water, and that's why we've got this problem. If you can look into the next slide, now one of the things that, if you look at water as waste, you do not need the same quality of water that you drink to flush your toilet. It talks to fit for purpose because that water you drink, it's more expensive than the water that you need to flush toilet. If we can start looking at how we use our water such that we use non-potable water for non-potable applications, we reduce what goes into the wastewater treatment works and we solve the problem. So for, for, for small businesses, uh, SMMEs, this is where we need to be. We, we, we need to be looking at solutions that are addressing our real problems. And uh, for inspiration, uh, as I've said, ASEN, we, we, we've got some representation in the continent. Our website is ASEN.Africa. They can join, uh, you know, there are various memberships. And then you get access to all the case studies that we have, to all the webinars, to all the workshops that we, 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 we hold. Because there is no business that is secular economy business. Secular economy principle are applies across all businesses. Yeah. So everyone can come and yeah. play. In Secular South Africa, we are trying to do exactly that, to say, come, let's talk together, let's share what we do, such that we have a bigger impact. And we need SMMEs in that space. Well, before we thank our guests for this afternoon, and Philip is asking a question at 24 minutes past three, Philip. No, it's going to have to wait until tea time, I'm afraid. Uh, Green Cape, in partnership with the Friedrich Norman Foundation for Freedom, 
is inviting innovators and entrepreneurs with economically viable green economy innovation business ideas to enter the 2023 Green Pitch Challenge. The business idea has to be one at an early stage or startup, must have a proof of concept, for example, a pilot project running, uh, looking for first round of seed funding, or two, be at pre-growth level, registered already, perhaps trading with sales and looking for a funding um, uh, opportunity. The Green Pitch a Challenge closes on the 8th of June, which is only in two days away. And so, Lashini, where do they find um, out more details about this? Okay, so um, for those in person, we actually have our head of um, communications here, uh, Solnet Pinar, somewhere in the crowd. Yes, um, she's actually heading this Green Pitch Challenge. So if you are in person, please do speak to her directly. We've also got a link on our website. So if you go through there, I just want to touch on, because we've got a lot of entrepreneurs and um, maybe SMMEs that may be here. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'd like to also mention, we focus on energy, water, agriculture, and, and circular economy activities, which includes organic waste, the plastics, as well as textiles. So those are some of the areas we're speaking in that competition. Um, but we also have, so we understand there is a challenge with getting funding. So we do have a green pro, a finance program as well at Green Cape. And they actually help facilitate um, green business and investments. So it's basically helping connect investors with SMMEs. So please also reach out on our website. You will get information from myself, Solnet, or from the website. Um, to see how they could help you. We've also got a database that they've put together um, uh, that has a lot of in, um, initiatives that you can actually look for funding sources or marketing, different, different areas, R&D, that you can actually speak to different organizations to get that funding as well. All right. And with that, I'd like to run of applause, please, for our guest, Solushni Naidu. <laughs> Uh, Circular Economy Program Manager at Green Cape, uh, Karin Bonsma, uh, the Director for Sustainable Inclusive Business based out in Kenya, and Domego Boyana. Uh, Domego is a Chief Executive Officer of Ben Peter Holdings, is also the South Africa Chapter Lead for ASEAN and a Council Member of the Cape Chamber of Commerce and Industry, a very busy man. Another round of applause, please, for our guest today. Thank you very much. Thank you. And while they make their way back to their seats in the auditorium, let me tell you about two of the artists that we are featuring here at our very first event. Uh, the first is Moore's Design. It's an upcycle initiative that aims to protect our environment by collecting non-toxic waste to create beautiful, usable, and practical products following a green path. The business believes that by keeping our landfills empty, we're contributing to save the environment whilst creating a sustainable fashion brand known both locally and internationally. You can go to mors, M-O-R-S dot C-O dot Z-A for more information. And those who are here, obviously, there are some product that is available for you to view. And then uh, Lily Lumpa Upcycle Hip Homeware, they launched in 2016. It's a um, business that manufactures a variety of products from storage holders to dinner table accessories to decor and small furniture and homeware, uh, all of which created through a process of hip cycling, uh, which is essentially upcycling discarded waste and transforming it into desirable products that would complement your home. You can visit lilylumpa.com for more information, but the business founder, Liesl Nodea, is actually in the building with us today. So when you're enjoying your refreshments after we uh, adjourn the meeting, you'll be able to engage with her and her product. Thank you very much both to Lily Lumpa as well as to Moore's Design for uh, bringing their works with us. Helen, what an afternoon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Are you leaving here inspired? Yes, I am leaving here inspired, and um, absolutely, um, because I, I realize a circular economy is an inspiring uh, topic, uh, but it's also a daunting topic, and it was, it was of course, clearly spelled out by, by some of the experts how daunting it is. Um, but what inspires me uh, about circular economy is that, uh, as an individual, you can contribute to it. and. Um, and that is something that uh, that you have that you have influence on, 
Um, and uh, I think what I heard about, uh, for instance, the organic waste uh, here in South Africa uh, is, is, is an area where uh, I, can, I, I can immediately s uh, see a lot of potential. Uh, there are uh, many good examples of uh, companies that have uh, used organic waste uh, to, uh, uh, that normally would end up in compost that, are, that is now used as boxes or packaging or uh, um, uh, other uh, functional uh, things f for that company. So there is, in the organic waste area, uh, it, it, uh, I, I see a lot of potential. That, that inspires me a lot. Absolutely, and I think it is good to note the examples that exist already in South Africa, the packs that people are going into, the potential for packs in other industries as well. Yeah. And I love Karen's point that we should be inspired by policy that has been successful in other parts of the world, but not just seek to replicate it, but contextualize it for what South Africa needs. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. And um, and perhaps uh, coming back to what what we started with in the beginning, uh, what inspired me in in my in my uh, previous uh, post in Turkey in the in the circular textile space, uh, and I want to uh, react to uh, something you said uh, there. Uh, uh, the the second hand clothing that came from Europe uh, from the West European countries. Uh, it was difficult to export that t to uh, Turkey because they were afraid of uh, all this clothing coming into the second uh, uh, into the second hand market. But what was inspiring there is that the uh, local textile organizations, the Turkish uh, textile organizations, were lobbying the go the government to please please change the law to allow this uh, the second hand clothing to come to our country because we have the, uh, the ability to really bring it uh, back to yarn and, 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 and collect the buttons and the zippers and everything. We can do that here. We have the knowledge here. Uh, so that is sort of contextualizing as well. Um, uh, allow, uh, where, uh, uh, allow the place where things can be done, uh, perhaps from a uh, historical perspective, can be done really well, allow that to happen. Uh, so uh, that, that to me was also very inspiring. Well, as you know, our next meeting is on the 4th of July and fashion is going to be one of the topics yeah. we're looking at. So I'm looking forward to that conversation. Thank you very much. Lovely, lovely to see you. A round of applause, please, for the Consul General of the Kingdom of the Netherlands to Cape Town, Helene Records. And thank you for your time this afternoon and for um, streaming and tuning in from wherever you are in Cape Town and in South Africa. This is an important conversation. It's the first of two dialogues. As I said, the next one is on the 4th of July before we have our Creative Exchange Design Festival, which is going to be in August, and we'll share the details of that with you as time unfolds. Please do continue using the hashtag Creative Exchange to reflect on whatever you've heard here today, whatever inspired you, whatever challenged you, or perhaps a question that you desperately need answered. Our team will continue to matter, monitor the social media and, of course, respond where necessary. Otherwise, have a wonderful Tuesday afternoon, and um, be safe. Until next time, goodbye. Thank you. I think the construction.